Hello, welcome back to this video on infinite discontinuity. We're in improper integrals and we're talking about infinite discontinuities. We have, sorry about that. Um, we have looked at a video previously where the lower limit was the cause of the integral being discontinuous, uh, the function being discontinuous, thus making the integral improper. And then we, in that same video, we saw another example where the upper limit was the culprit that caused the function to be discontinuous, thus causing the integral to be improper. Well, now in this particular example, something very strange happens. The place where the function is discontinuous at is not the upper limit, it's not the lower limit. The place where the function is discontinuous at is in between the upper and the lower limit. Call it C in between A and B. So you have to break the integral into two separate integrals, both of which are improper, where you go from A to C and then you go from C to B. And then you rip out those C's, you replace them with a variable T, and then you let that variable approach C from the appropriate side. Okay, now here's the issue with these questions. This question might have appeared in a previous class and it looks innocent. It seems like, oh, it's just a simple integral, find an antiderivative, power rule in reverse, and not even think twice about the bounds. You just plug them in and you get an answer. But there's a problem. This integral would have never appeared in the previous class because of the fact that it's improper. You see, if the integral went from one to three, yeah, the previous class. But because the integral goes from negative two to three, that covers up zero. And look at the denominator, it is zero when x is zero. And so we break this into two separate integrals. We go from negative two to zero, and then we go from zero to three. Okay, all right, great. Rip out those zeros, put in variables uh, like t here. Now on the left one, we have uh, t approaching uh, zero from the left, and on the right one, we have t approaching zero from the right. It's based off of the interval and how you only care about one hand, one one side of the limit. Uh, Antiderivative, you know, it's just um, x to the negative four, so um, that's x to the negative three over over uh, negative three. When rewritten, though, it's better to write it like this negative one over three x cubed. Our job, put a t in and put a minus two in for the first one. Put a three in and put a t in for the second one. Now let's argue what happens here. Uh, t goes to zero, but from smaller numbers like negative one over a billion. You cube it, it's negative, but it's even smaller. And you are taking it times in it by three, still negative still small very very small like now like negative three over a billion cubed has 27 zeros in it what's going to happen though is that that fraction will then flip up and it becomes uh, i guess it's both both positive um both the numerator and denominator are negative so that ends up as positive infinity the other one's minus 24 you know when you put a negative two in there but a uh, minus one over 24 but uh, it doesn't, you know, the uh, the first part is blown up to infinity, so it doesn't matter. And the fact that, that that one goes to infinity, you can pretty much conclude then that the integral is divergent. But the other one goes to infinity as well. The second limit goes to infinity as well. Uh, it's more straightforward. It's uh, from the positive side. But yeah, for the same reasoning, though, it is going to be infinite. And so the difference here between this one and the other examples is, is really about, at the heart of the matter, it's about the rate at which you're approaching that asymptote. This one's going very slowly towards the asymptote. While the other ones, you rapidly approach the asymptote. Well, you never really get there, but you, but you, um, you rapidly get very, very close. <laughs> this one, it takes a long time to get very, very close. And so therefore, um, the integral is divergent. That has infinite area. Okay, each side is actually infinite. 
um, zero to uh, three on the right hand side and negative two to zero. So, all right, one more example. Um, made up word. Um, doubly improper, improper for two reasons. <laughs> As if one wasn't enough. Every example we've done so far was improper for only one reason. Now we're going to have improper for two reasons. Um, the example that I'm going to go with is having a, a place where your lower limit is a disc discontinuity and your upper limit is infinite. In this one, much like the previous question, you're going to pick a place in between. Something easy to plug in other than the, the zero, something like a one or a two, something simple to plug in. And you're going to break it up into two integrals, go from zero to two and then from two to infinity. And um, technically, you have left handed, uh, you have a, a right hand limit on the approaching zero. But, you know, as you approach infinity, um, that's for the other variable. And so uh, here's our example for that one. It's going to be a tough one. We have a zero to infinity, um, e to the negative one over x, all over x squared. Denominator is equal to zero at x equals zero. So lower limit is causing us to be discontinuous. So the integral is improper, but upper limit is infinite. The integral is improper doubly. <laughs> so we pick something between zero and infinity. Uh, we pick a one. And we go from zero to one, and then we go from one to infinity, and we replace the zero, and we replace the infinity with variables, and we let those variables approach the uh, zero from the right-hand side, and then the other one's going to approach infinity. All right, great. Let's discuss integrating. E to the negative one over x, over x squared. Um, hopefully, you recognize that uh, negative one over x is derivative is actually positive one over x squared. So you have a perfect setup for a u sub. You'll end up with an e to the u because everything will cancel out. du is all the rest of it. And so you have um, e to the u du. Antiderivative, of course, is e to the u. So our antiderivative is e to the negative one over x. All right, great. Uh, but once again, negative exponent is better to put in the denominator. So we have uh, 1 over e to the 1 over x. There's a lot going on there. And hopefully with the next slide, I can convince you of what's going on. But first, we have to put a 1 in and put an a in for the, for the uh, integral that's on the left. Put a b in and then put a 1 in for the integral that's on the right. Upper limit minus lower limit. And, um, you know, what's going to happen here is that the, when you plug the 1 in, it was on the positive side, but when you plug the one in, it was a lower limit on the other, so the two will cancel out. The one over e's will cancel out. And now our job is to figure out what's going on with these two limits. Uh, my animation is out of order here. Um, it has the final result there. But um, I don't know why the animation is such out of order like this. It's strange. But uh, I'm going to show you on the next slide why the left limit is zero and the right limit is one. Uh, here's a picture of the graph. Total area under that graph is equal to one. Next section, we're going to find out that's very important. That's going to be a special kind of function that has the total area equal to one while the function is always above the x axis, special kind of function. All right, why do these limits end up being what they are? Okay, let's take a look on the next slide. Okay, um, the, uh, the, the left is a one-sided limit okay we're coming towards zero from the right hand side so when you think about going towards zero from the right hand side um i like to conceive of one over a billion that's my that's my plug-in <laughs> that's what i that's what i consider and I, I in my brain you're about to take a peek inside my brain okay here's how my brain works um i need to figure out this limit and so i say that this limit is similar to literally what i plug what I get when I plug in one over a billion for A, but it's one over one over a billion. How does that work? It's the reciprocal of one over a billion. It's a billion up in that exponent. And so we have one over E to the billion. Okay. 
Now, what's going on there is basically the denominator is as large as you could ever imagine being. And so um, I just put a variable in its place. That variable is going to infinity for sure. And so uh, one over something very big, though, one over something that's going to infinity, cutting one into infinitely many pieces, it's going to go to zero. Okay. And it's okay to reason it out like that for one side of limits. Uh, for the other one, we have uh, 1 over e to the 1 over b. And b is getting very large. So like above, let's plug in something very large. So in my brain, I'm going to plug a billion in. And so you're going to replace the uh, b with a billion. So this is going to be similar to 1 over e to the 1 over a billion. Okay. 1 over a billion is very small, and I can get even smaller by using something more than a billion, so that exponent is going to 0. But e to the 0 is going to be a 1, and so that's why the second limit is 1. Sorry, this video was a little longer than expected, but um, yes, the first is uh, was 0, the second is 1. Total area is equal to 1. Let me just go back to the slide before this, if that's possible. No, nope. okay, I can just backtrack, I guess. Oh gosh. Okay, I just want you to see the area there. Again, yeah, so the total, total answer is one. All right, all right, thank you for watching. My name is Nakai Rimmer. I am here to help you through this. Um, if you have any questions, don't be afraid to ask. Comment down below. Seek me out on my webpage. Um, and um, I'm, here to, I'm here to help you through this. Um, like and subscribe. Take care. See you in the next video.